Everybody there back? Okay. All right, Hebrews 5. I, I need to, you know, it, it may kind of, may get off to a rough start tonight. I don't know. I mean, I'm having trouble just piecing it all, tying it all together tonight. So you all bear with me a minute. Again, pray for me. Uh, pray, pray God does the preaching. Pray for my voice. Um, but Hebrews 5 verse 1 says, uh, For every high priest, it's talking about the Levitical priesthood, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both sacrifice, oh, both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but that, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. If you will, bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, again for all that you've done for us, for all your many blessings. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for... Uh, shielding us. We thank you, Lord, for the hedge that you've had around about us, Lord, and we ask that you'd continue that. Lord, we thank you again for each one that's out here tonight, Lord, and we just ask, Lord, that you'd just pour your spirit out here tonight. Lord, give each one a spirit of obedience, Lord, that we might serve you in spirit and in truth, Lord, that we might please you tonight. Lord, take away the cares of the world, Lord. Don't let any of us have our minds on anything except for you tonight, Lord. If there's a need here, we ask that you'd meet it. And Lord, we ask, Lord, tonight that you'd give me the words to say, Lord. Help me to preach, Lord. I help each one of us, Lord, to apply it to our lives, Lord, in the way that you'd see fit tonight, Lord. Lord, just help us, move us to that new ground, Lord. Lord, it's all these things that we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name, Lord, and amen. Now, like I said, bear with me for a minute here tonight. Let me get it, let me get it pieced together until I get the, the juices flowing here a little bit, but... Uh, it starts out talking about the, the Levitical priesthood, the man priest that stood uh, as an intercessor really between the, the children of Israel and God. Uh, they, they were the chosen people that could do this. Uh, but even being a chosen people, uh, you know, we know we've all got callings of our own and stuff like that. Uh, even being chosen didn't make them perfect. It, they were still in the flesh. And uh, it says here that uh, as they offered sacrifice for the children of Israel, that they ought also to offer sacrifice for their own sins. Now, you know, we, we know the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That, you know, we know all that. When all of us have failed, all of us have committed sin in our life. And now uh, we don't need to prove that tonight or anything, but uh, we see here that this priest, even this chosen one, uh, still had to offer for his own sin. But God uh, set forth Christ as a a different kind of a priest, if you will, tonight. It says in verse 5, it says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made in high priest. Uh, he didn't set himself up as in high priest, but God the Father uh, set Christ up as in high priest. Now, uh, it talks about these callings, and I've never met what I felt like was a true call of God uh, preacher or pastor that didn't run from it for a while. I'm going to tell you what. Uh, it's not nearly as glorious a thing as it may appear sometimes. You know, you've got to deal with a lot of things. And But when God bestows that on you, it's your calling. And here He's bestowed this thing upon Christ, this priesthood uh, upon Christ. And it says that uh, the second half of verse 5 says, But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Of course, it's talking about God the Father speaking this to Christ. And verse 6 says, As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Now, uh, Melchizedek tonight, he's, uh, that's where I want to focus my attention tonight is Melchizedek. And there's not too much known about Melchizedek in the Bible. We don't talk about him much. 
Uh, but what it does talk about him is very powerful uh, scriptures in the Bible. Now, it's very powerful. Uh, and a lot of people believe that Melchizedek was an Old Testament appearance of Christ. And uh, there are those appearances of Christ. I couldn't say for sure tonight that it's the Old Testament appearance of Christ, uh, but I, I lean toward that belief tonight myself. And I'll, I'll show you that more as we go on. But uh, it says there, starts to tell a little bit about Melchizedek. It says that uh, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, uh, unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Now, uh, right away we start to see this picture of Christ. And uh, people say, well, I don't see Christ in this. Uh, I see Christ in this. I'm going to tell you, the whole Bible, uh, I've talked about it a lot before, but the Old Testament, you get back in there and uh, the whole Old Testament points toward Christ. It's uh, it's all about the coming of Christ. And uh, then you get into the New Testament, the New Covenant, and it is Christ. I'm going to tell you, uh, this Bible is the Word of God. Christ said that He was the Word. The Word was uh, begotten that day, and He was the Word. And uh, here we start to see this picture of Christ in that uh, when man fell into need, when we fell into sin, and we needed salvation, uh, that He offered prayers and supplications. Remember that uh, trip that He made through the Garden of Gethsemane there, and uh, He prayed, and the sweat became His great drops of blood. How that He labored in prayer, and uh, how that He called out on the Father, and He told Him, He said, Father, uh, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me, but uh, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, he was willing to labor, and he was willing to sacrifice for us. And I believe that he feared the Father. I believe uh, I'm not talking about a fear like you'd be afraid of something. I'm talking about reverence tonight. I'm talking about uh, respect. I'm talking about uh, glorifying, honor, and fear tonight. But he feared the Father, and uh, he offered uh, all these prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. Uh, we see that as Christ done that in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 8 says, Though He were a son, yet He learned uh, learned He obedience by the things which He suffered. And uh, being made perfect, He became the author of eternal salvation unto them that obey Him. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you what, I've, I've said it a lot of different times. I've heard it said, God's a gentleman. Uh, he's not going to force this thing on you. If you don't want the best thing that ever happened to us, I just leave it laying at the door. He's not going to force it. Uh, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Uh, but if the man inside's got to open, you've got to allow him to come in tonight. Uh, there has to be a willingness. There has to be uh, submitting under the Spirit of God. There has to be a willingness to obey. Oh, you can be none of his tonight. I don't believe it. And it says there in verse 10, Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And I'm going to tell you, this Melchizedek was a special man. Whether you believe he was Christ or not, uh, he was a special man. And I, I don't want to get ahead of myself too, not, too far tonight because I'm, I'm, I'm on thin ice as it is. But if you get over into chapter 7 here, I, I got, uh, there's a lot about Melchizedek in chapter 7. It says in verse 1, it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings, uh, and blessed him. He blessed Abraham, which was the patriarch. Abraham was the father of all the Jews. If you remember uh, in the New Testament, there, Christ got onto the Pharisees and uh, they said, we're the children of Abraham. But God knew, uh, Christ knew, that that wasn't anything to brag about. He said, well, I can raise up rocks under, uh, under Abraham, under God here. I can raise up the rocks and, and make children of Abraham. Uh, that's not all we've got to lean on today. We're a child of God. I'm going to tell you, we got one better than Abraham and we got one better than any uh, a Levitical priest in the Old Testament. we got a high priest today uh, that's able to make intercession for us and he don't have to offer uh, for his own sins on his way in to offer for ours. Uh, i got a big problem. You know, I, I talk about it every now and then, but uh, you look into the Catholic Church and they come to some priest somewhere in a little dark closet uh, and they start to confess their sins to him and uh, he's sitting over there eating crackers. I don't know what he's doing while they're confessing, but uh, finally he says, listen, here's what you need to do. Uh, go and say 38 Hail Marys and uh, come back and see me next week. Just go right back into what you're doing. And uh, the same one, how many of them have been caught molesting children? Uh, how many of them have been caught in sin themselves? How many of them are openly practicing homosexuals? Uh, how many of them are separated from God for the world to see? Uh, and yet they, they sit in a place to make intercession between me and God. I'm going to tell you what, if there's a weak link between me and God, I want it to be me, not somebody else's sin. I'm weak enough on my own, brother. 
I don't need nothing on weaker than me, you know, in between me and God. But it says, To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation the king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. See, Abraham gave him a tithe. And uh, it's over in Genesis 14. I'll try to read some of it before we're done tonight. But uh, he went out into this battle of kings and he come back. And uh, Melchizedek, the Bible says that he met Abraham coming back. And Abraham gave him a tithe. Uh, he gave him a tenth of all the spoils of the war that he had been into. And uh, I know that sounds like nothing much tonight. It sounds like a typical thing. Hey, the law of the tithe uh, didn't come into play until Leviticus chapter 27, I believe it is. Uh, Abraham knew to do this because this was one to be exalted. Uh, this was one that was above him. This was one that was above the patriarch. Uh, he was one that was worthy, Lord, uh, worthy to, to receive the tenth of all the spoils and more. And he was able uh, to bless Abraham when he come back from that battle of kings that it talks about in uh, Genesis 14. It says, Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now, this is talking about Melchizedek. You get to reading about him through Hebrews here. Uh, you get to, it starts getting confusing. You start wondering, is it talking about Christ? Is it talking about him? The two start to run together. But it says right there uh, that he abideth a priest continually. Christ made a priest after the order of Melchizedek who abideth a priest continually. I don't know any man that ever walked this earth that was able to have uh, eternal life in any kind of a flesh or anything like that, uh, but this man here abideth a priest continually. Uh, he was without mother, without father, without earthly mother and father. Now, you say Jesus had a mother, Mary. Uh, I'm going to tell you what, it wasn't because he had to have one. Uh, it was because God seemed fit to send him as a man uh, because he comes to save the man. I'm going to tell you what. Uh, he didn't send him as a buffalo because the buffalo didn't need redemption. We was the ones that was lost in sin. Without beginning of days. Without, without ending of days. Abide as a priest continually. Well, I hope all this ties together good. Now, verse 4 says, Now consider how great this man was unto whom uh, even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Now, like I said, he was uh, Abraham, the greatest man in the, in the, to the Jews. Now, he was the greatest man to ever walk the earth to the Jews. And uh, this man was worthy to receive tithes of Abraham. That set him above all of them. Uh, and it says there, I'm going to skip down to verse 8. It says, uh, And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom he is witness that he liveth. I uh, see, he abideth forever. He's living here. And verse 9 says, And as... And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now we talk about this Levitical priesthood being high and mighty. Boy, they wore the robes, they wore all the uh, priestly garments. Uh, the Pharisees, uh, uh, they walked the streets crying aloud. They would make themselves look bad when they fasted and prayed and all that stuff uh, for the glory of men. Boy, they was something to see. They was a show to behold. Uh, but this man here, Melchizedek, was uh, there to receive the tithes of the patriarch while Levi was still uh, in his father's womb, uh, loins there, before he had ever come forth as a man, uh, there was Melchizedek. Does that remind you of anybody else? The one present uh, from the foundation of the world, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, uh, the one that was before Abraham, before the priest, before all the law, uh, was Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen? I ain't even there yet. I don't know. <laughs> you all bear with me. First, skip down to 15. I'm trying not to read you from to death tonight. 15 said, uh, And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Now, uh, you see there again the picture of Christ. It's talking about Christ being made after the power of an endless life. I believe in one place in Romans over there it says that uh, that we're reconciled to God by His life. It's not by His death. Uh, it's not by what happened on the cross altogether. Uh, it's because He was raised on the third day because He come out of the tomb. Uh, not because He went in. There's been millions upon millions of people 
uh, that's went into a tomb somewhere and they've never come out of there. Uh, but Christ went in and He told His disciples, He said, I've got the power uh, to lay it down and I've got the power to take it up again. Uh, the Bible says that we believe, uh, uh, we must believe that God has raised Him from the dead. I'm going to tell you what, it sets Him apart from all these false gods, uh, all these uh, idols and things like that that people are worshiping today, uh, all the things that they're allowed into our schools because they've got no power about them. Uh, all of them have went into a tomb somewhere, uh, and somewhere or another, if you know where to look, you could find a box full of bones. Uh, Christ come out of the tomb that day. Uh, I remember four or five years ago, they found the tomb of Christ. They found a box there that uh, had Jesus scratched on the end of it, and it had a bunch of bones in there. I come to church that night, I said, well, I got good news. Now, for you people that didn't like coming to church, no ways you can quit because they found the bones of Christ. And uh, all of them, of course, just sat right there like knots on a log. And I said, true faith is to understand that He rose out of the tomb uh, when you're standing there looking at a box of bones. I'm going to tell you what, I don't have to wonder. I don't have to ask nobody because I met Him face to face one day. Uh, he come to me one day when I wasn't worthy. Uh, he'd been dealing with me and trying to get me for a long time. I believe he come to me for the last time that day. But I met the man sure as the world today. If all you've got is that they ain't found his bones nowhere yet, hey, you ain't got much. <laughs> unless you've met him face to face. Unless you've had an interaction. I'm talking about meeting up with God. I'm talking about born again. I'm not talking about anything that happens in this flesh. I'm talking about a spirit coming alive. I'm saying, uh, Jesus Christ, He said, I'm a quickening spirit. Uh, he's one that brings life and life more abundant. Uh, he's not come to straighten your flesh up or anything like that. Uh, he's come to save an inward man. And that inward man should produce a change in the outward man. Uh, but so many of us, we feed the outward man, he becomes stronger. Uh, we don't kill that man. We don't crucify him. We don't die daily. Uh, we just cater to his needs. Boy, I'm hungry. Boy, I'm sleeping. Uh, boy, I'm too tired to go and hear the Word of God. I want to know where your priorities are tonight. Uh, what's important to you tonight? Uh, I preached last Sunday. I was coming down to church Sunday morning. I met the four wheelers and the boats and the uh, seen people mowing their yards and out doing everything in the world. Uh, nothing wrong with them things in their cells now, but when it becomes something that separates you from God, uh, you might as well set a totem pole in your backyard and bow down to the thing. It's an idol. Amen. It's an idol. Yep. Down in 24. Like I said, I ain't even got to the good part, I don't think. 24 says, But this man, because he continues forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Now, well, I tell you, whew, talked about it this morning. These little people, they come around your church house. Oh, I think I'm saved. <laughs> you better get saved. <laughs> I'm telling you what, he ain't going to sneak in there without you knowing it. You're saved to the uttermost. You're not just saved a little bit. You're not brought just a little bit out of death into life. Uh, you're brought from death into life. You're, brought, you're made a new creature. I don't think there was ever a baby born alive on this earth that didn't know something had changed, you know? I don't know. I may, I may not have an understanding of it all. Uh, that may be the way it's worked for some of us when we got saved. Maybe we didn't understand just exactly uh, what had happened to us. But you take a child out of the womb, uh, he's born a new creature into the world. He knows something has changed, believe me. It says that He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice uh, first for his own sins and then for the people's for when for this he did once when he offered up himself. Now, uh, you see right there that Christ is not offering for his own sins. He never had to do that. Uh, he walked a perfect life. And I'm going to tell you what, uh, if, if he ain't done nothing for you, you ought to be impressed with him just for walking a perfect life uh, where we have failed time after time after time. 
Uh, I'm going to tell you what, though. He didn't do that in vain. Uh, he didn't do that just uh, because he was bored and didn't have anything else to do. Uh, he done that because he's the perfect Lamb of God uh, and because he was the only one worthy to stand in that place. Uh, he was the only one worthy to hang on that cross. Uh, the Bible talks about God searching the earth. And none was found worthy but Jesus Christ himself. Uh, they was one worthy and he was willing to lay down that life. Hey, they didn't just nail him down and him fighting and screaming. <laughs> he wasn't trying to get away when they nailed him to the cross. I think I'm about to get to some of the good part. Psalms 110. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. Psalms 110, verse 1 says, The Lord said unto my Lord, <laughs> What? <laughs> Who's he talking to? It's the Father talking to the Son. You say, we done said a while ago, some people don't believe Christ is in the Old Testament. Who's he talking to? The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. <laughs> you got that, didn't you, brother? It says, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy prayer. Uh, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning thou shalt, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Uh, them four verses right there show Christ as a sovereign king. Uh, I'm going to tell you what, Melchizedek wasn't just a priest. Uh, he wasn't just some uh, body that was set up to make intercession to receive tithes or anything like that. Uh, he was the king of Salem over there. He was a king priest. Uh, he was set above all the other priests that's ever mentioned in the Bible except Jesus Christ. Christ come in the order of Melchizedek. Uh, he's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. I'm going to tell you what. Uh, he's more than just somebody that hung on a cross one day. I read an article one time. It's been years back. I don't know how come you even remember this, but uh, some man had wrote a little article and he said that uh, somebody had asked him who the most influential person that ever was to walk the earth. And he said uh, Jesus Christ was the most influential person in the, that had ever walked the earth. He said whether you believe that he was the Son of God or not, now you look at his life, you look at what he done, now you look how impressive he was and all those kind of things, but I'm going to tell you what, that don't cut it tonight. He didn't come down here a prophet. Uh, he didn't come down here just a run-of-the-mill servant of God. Uh, he come a sovereign king. He's going to come back one of these days uh, in all of his glory, and there's going to be a lot of people. Uh, we read the other night in Isaiah over there. There's going to be a lot of people that runs to him. Boy, they think they're running to safety. Uh, and when they get inside of the Lord, he's going to start start to rebuke. Uh, he's going to start to turn them away. I'm going to tell you what. Uh, these false senses of security, uh, these telling people they're saved whether they believe it or not, uh, I'm going to tell you what. You better not tell nobody they're saved till they tell you that they are saved. I'm tired of the repeat after me. I'm tired of the send me $40 and you're saved, you know. I'm tired of the you showed up every Sunday for Three months straight, you're bound to be a Christian. Hey, I'm going to tell you what, the devil's here every service. He's in no way, form, or fashion a Christian. And he's in no way a sovereign king. The Bible uh, calls him in one place, says that he's the prince and power of the air. He's not a king. There's one above him today. Uh, that's why he don't have dominion over us. That's why he can't force you into subjection is because there's one that outranks him. And the Bible talks about, it says that they can't take the house unless they're able to bind the strong man of the house. I'm going to tell you what, just like I said this morning, uh, you, you're a born again child of God and uh, you get out of here into sin, it's willful sin. There ain't no such thing as unwillful sin for the child of God uh, because he said that he would put no temptation in front of us uh, that he didn't make a way of escape. I'm going to tell you what, uh, we partake of sin because it looks good to this man right here uh, and we want the thing and we take it. Boy, everybody's quiet tonight. Whew. Perk up a little. That's what. <laughs> Look like your mother in law moved in again. Verse 4 says that the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's an eternal priest. He's not only a king priest, 
He's not only one that was worthy to receive tithes of the patriarch of the Jews, uh, but He's an eternal priest. There's an eternal priesthood uh, that goes along with Jesus Christ. He's not a temporary thing. Uh, He shouldn't be something in your life that comes and goes as you please. Uh, He shouldn't be something that uh, causes you to shed a little tear or something like that as you walk the aisle, uh, pop in your bubble gum and jump right back and run out into the world tomorrow. I'm going to tell you what, He said that He brought uh, eternal life. And I'm going to tell you what, it starts when you get saved, uh, it should go right on. If it don't go right on, you've got something lacking. Uh, You need to examine yourself. And there's a good place to do it. I find you an order of repentance somewhere. I get down there and start to ask God. Start to talk to Him. Start to find out if you can get into the Spirit of God. Start to find out if He'll speak to you anymore. People say, God don't speak to everybody. Jesus Christ said, my sheep know my voice uh, and they follow me. I'm going to tell you what, you might not hear Him thundering out of a mountainside somewhere, uh, but there should be something in you that tells you right from wrong, that tells you what's for the glory of God and what's for not for the glory of God. Amen? Yes, sir. He's a sovereign king. He's an eternal priest. He says, The, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through the kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. I'm going to tell you what, he's coming back as a victorious king. Uh, he's not going to be defeated. We go through life, battle after battle, day after day, and uh, we think, God, I just can't see my way out of this. We talked about it this morning in Sunday school. Uh, we ought to be able to look back and see that God's brought us uh, through trial after trial, through fire after fire, uh, through problem after problem that we couldn't see the end of. He's brought us through every one of them. Uh, what makes us think that he's not able to bring us out the other side of the one that you're standing in? right now you're going to have to turn it loose and give it to him he's victorious if we don't have the victory it's because we've not took hold of it and I'm not one of these fellows that stands up here and just says pray whatever you want to when you get to the end of it say I'm going to claim that in the name of Jesus and it'll be done hey it better be in the will of God or it ain't going to be done don't ask God to give you a new Buick or something like that when you don't need one. I'm going to tell you what, it better be in the will of God. We talked about praying in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's, I tell you what, God sets the role of ambassador right on us. Uh, he gives us the ability to speak for Him, to pray in His name. Uh, it's just like the, uh, me and Donna was talking about a bond slave today. When they become a bond slave, you was able to speak through master. Uh, you could go down to the hardware store and say, uh, I need three boxes of nails, and it was just as good as if the, the owner of that bond slave had come down there and bought him himself. He was trusted uh, to speak for the master. When you become a child of God and get into the will of God, uh, you're an ambassador of God and you should be able to speak the will of God Uh, but we don't have any discernment anymore we've lost it because we're blinded by the things of the world it's got to be in the will (laughs) God's just not going to do it if it's not in his will everybody says well that all sounds pretty good you know Boy, that Jesus Christ, he's something to behold, ain't he? How's that apply to us, brother? <laughs> Where are you going with all this? First Peter chapter 1, and I'll soon be coming to a close, so if you all want to be figuring out, if somebody figure me out a song of invitation here in a minute, I ain't going to keep you much longer. I hope David's got something for us after I get done, but First Peter 2, starting in verse 9, it says, but ye... Now, we've talked about Christ and we've talked about Melchizedek. We've talked about an eternal king, a victorious king. Uh, we've talked about all these things and then First Peter 2, 9 starts out and says, but ye... Hold the phone, right? <laughs> Whoa now, where are we going now? Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, uh, but now have obtained mercy. Uh, Don't the Bible tell us that we're heirs and joint heirs with Christ? 
I believe it said right there that we're a royal priesthood. I'm going to tell you what. Christ come in the order of Melchizedek. Who do you think we're in the order of? What did they call us at Antioch that day? Uh, those people that serve God in a way that they look so much like Christ. Uh, they said these people are Christians. I'm going to tell you what. Uh, they didn't hang their, that name on themselves. And I think it's a disgrace sometimes to call some saved people Christians. Uh, that's a generic name we got for everybody. I'm going to tell you what. Uh, just like David said, just because you made some profession of faith 20 years ago, uh, you got no life in you. you got nothing for God. Uh, you're not a Christian tonight. You're not Christ-like. Uh, you're not one that, that uh, looks like the Son of God walking around on this earth. Uh, you're one that looks like you've got some kind of form of godliness, but you've denied the power of it. You're the one that looks like you've got a routine that you're stuck in. You're the one that comes and sits on your hands and uh, don't receive a blessing because you don't want one anymore. Uh, I'm going to tell you what, He made us a royal priesthood. Uh, he made us a people that could go out here and step on toes. I remember uh, I've been talking about this ministry for so long. I, I want that ministry. I want a presence of God about me uh, that when I walk out into the world and I start to pass the loss, uh, that they start to feel the conviction of God because God abides in me. Uh, I'm going to tell you what, we're made a royal priesthood in the order of Jesus Christ. Uh, who's made a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Uh, we're heirs and joint heirs. We're children of God. We're grafted in tonight. Uh, there is no reason tonight that every person here uh, shouldn't be a, living a life that's holy and acceptable before God. Uh, the Bible says, you know, we talk about this salvation not costing anything. I won't charge you a dime for it tonight. Uh, but God said, present your body a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. I'm going to tell you what. Uh, don't think tonight that you can make a profession of faith somewhere and God not expect nothing of you. He's give you the best He's got. What makes us think we can just sit back and never do anything for God? What's He say? He said, I've saved you. What? Unto a good work. I've said it a dozen times lately. It seems like everything overlaps. Uh, God don't save us by works. We're not saved by works or anything like that. I don't preach works salvation. I believe when God gets a hold of you and makes a new creature, uh, it's going to produce some works. I believe there's a call and come uh, with that salvation. I believe there's something for you to do for God. And uh, we, look, we preached the other night on that remnant. There's a remnant of God. Uh, there's a little percentage of the people that's supposed to be of God, that truly loves God, uh, that's willing to lay aside their world and, and take up the things of God. Uh, why why wouldn't you want to be in that people tonight? Why wouldn't you want to be one of the chosen of the priesthood here uh, that God is willing and able to bless tonight beyond measure? Why wouldn't you want to walk the streets and feel the glory of God? Why wouldn't you want that table prepared in the presence of your enemies tonight? Amen. What about this don't want somebody wants, you know? They say we might act like you. <laughs> they, uh, they're the worst things, <laughs> you know. Sure, Come on. My mom used to tell me all the time, you act just like your daddy. I said, they're the worst things. <laughs> A peculiar people. Remember I told you, I call it the chameleon syndrome. <laughs> Christians got the chameleon syndrome. You seen them little old bug-eyed lizards? They call them a chameleon. And you stick him on the wall over here and he'll turn white. And you put him on the seat and he'll turn blue. And you put him on this and he'll turn brown. He just blends wherever he goes. I don't know what he'd do if you put him on something striped. He'd be hurt. Yeah. But he blends wherever he goes. Half the people waving their Christian flag. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was looking on, looking on Facebook the other day. Some girl on there, she'd been to this Christian concert talking about making a difference. The very next thing, I looked on there and she's got pictures of tattoos running right down her back that she just got a day or two ago. You might not think it's wrong, but it don't uplift God. I'm going to tell you that. Some of them get on there praising God on Sunday and Monday they're cussing somebody out. Yeah. <laughs> what 
kind of life is that? Hypocrite. We're supposed to be a peculiar people. You're just not supposed to fit in every hole you get in. <laughs> you know? <laughs> a square peg <laughs> ain't supposed to fit in a round hole, you know? You're just not supposed to fit everywhere you go. But we do anymore. You know, most Christians, they do anymore. They fit in. I, I tell you what, you think about it. I'm not, again, I'm not judging anybody's soul. I'm not saying some are saved, some are not. That's between them and God. But you think about it and tell me the truth. If most people claiming to be Christians today wouldn't fit in just as good at any bar in Richmond as they would this church house tonight, maybe better. How many of them wouldn't do that? I mean, you see a, a remnant, you know. Me and Donald talking this morning. He said, how, much of the, how, much, how many church members do you think have never been saved? I said, I think about 90%. He thought I was a little high in that. But I'm going to tell you what, I've been fooling with church members for a while. <laughs> you know? I hope I'm bad wrong on that. I, I hope it's not nearly as bad as I think it is. But you got too many of these fellas that'll stand up there and smile and pat you on the back, and maybe when you're standing in torments one day, you'll be able to see his smiling face. You'll be able to see his teeth for sure, because he'll be biting on you probably if he can find you. We're a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Is it marvelous or not? I mean, <laughs> come on. I mean, most Christians today, they walking around, they got a face longer than a mule, you know? <laughs> you, hear the, you hear the one, the, the horse walks up, and the guy says, why the long face? <laughs> you know, get it? He had a long face. Christians today don't look no different, you know? We make it look miserable most of the time, most of us. And we're supposed to be, we're supposed to have peace beyond understanding. We're supposed to have joy unspeakable. But we don't. A lot of us don't. It says, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. That's talking to the Gentiles. Anybody here know who the Gentiles are? <laughs> find you a mirror somewhere you'll see a Gentile we used to be considered the dogs remember that little woman that told Jesus said the, the dogs eat from the crumbs of the master's table it's because she's a Gentile just like us he said which not had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy I wonder what God would have to do for some people to get them to praise him you know Boy, I don't know. I mean, it seems like the ones that won't praise and honor Him, maybe they just don't understand what God's done for them. Maybe they've not got it into their mind what He went through and what He gave for us. But it was a price that we couldn't pay. And it was the same for everybody. Think about this tonight. Somebody be coming with a song. If you all, whoever. But think about this tonight. Adolf Hitler. We was talking about him the other night. Probably the, the worst man in history that I can think of anyway. If he ain't the worst, he's bad enough. Alright? Yeah. Consider this tonight. God paid the same price for you as he did Adolf Hitler. Yes. You cost him just as much as Adolf Hitler did. Now Hitler probably never turned to God. I don't believe he did. Maybe you have, maybe you've not. But there was a price paid for Hitler, just like there's a price paid for you tonight. And it cost him the same. Read over in uh, Exodus 30, I think it is. The price of atonement was a half shekel for everybody that was over the age of 20 and the children of Israel. The good, the bad, and the ugly paid a half shekel. All of them. That was the price of atonement. The price of atonement's been the same for every one of us. As we stand tonight, 
This altar is open tonight. Come and pray tonight. Come and pray. Think about what He's done for you. Think about where He's brought you from. Think about how worthy He is tonight to be honored and to be glorified. This altar is open. Come and pray. Maybe it's been a long time. Maybe it's been a while since you've come and prayed. Don't let nothing hinder you tonight. I believe that God's took away the hindrances. I believe He's took away anything that could bind us tonight. The only thing left to keep you from moving up tonight is you. It's like I talked about. I don't want something weaker than I am standing between me and God. But tonight there's nothing standing between you and God. It's just you. Pray tonight. Pray if God's leading you. Now's your time to uh, get a hold of God. Now's the time when the water's troubled and uh, God's listening tonight. This is the time. This is a sanctified time tonight. You know that word sanctified, set aside for a holy purpose. Now, I'm going to tell you what, God's allowed us this time tonight uh, for a holy purpose, to honor and glorify Him tonight, to pray to Him, to ask Him, to lay our petitions at His feet tonight, and to see answers tonight. Like we said when we come in tonight, pray just like Jacob wrestled that angel over. Don't turn loose of God till He blesses you tonight. Hold on to Him and don't turn loose. Wrestle with Him tonight if you need to. Lay them petitions down. Get answers tonight. I, I can't help but believe that God wants to bless us. That God wants to give us answers. That God wants to uh, do the things that we're asking. But we've got to put them at His feet tonight. And we've got to hold on to Him until we get that answer.
pray as long as you need to. Just keep on praying. be hindered tonight. Just keep a praying. Don't have your minds on things of the world. Just pray tonight. Seek the face of God tonight. Thank you. 